go ahead and introduce yourself for the audience and then we'll get started. Sure. All right, I'm Jonah, um, Quibbles Over Coffee on YouTube. Um, I haven't uploaded on YouTube in a while, uh, but um, that's who I am. Yeah, I don't know. Cool. Do you want like a background of like what I do for work? I don't know. What else <laughs> no, do you no, want? Just whatever you wanted to introduce yourself with okay. so people that's know That's all you. I'll go with, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm just going to be upfront. I don't know what angle you're coming at this with. I know that you did say that you wanted to uh, debate whether or not we should. Is it the West or is it the United States specifically? Well, I don't care about the West generally. I okay. care about the United States. <laughs> okay. So um, this is the United States. Let so, me go ahead and change my, yeah, my title here. States. But uh, so I don't know what where you're coming from from this. So if you could explain your position a bit just so I have a better understanding. Yeah, so my basic position um, as like a starting point um, is that America is a union by and for the people, but the people that are described there are the American people. It's not just people writ large. Um, and so we have obligations to Americans um, and that's where our obligations stop. Um, and so when I think about, you know, what we have, when we have to do as a, as a government, we have to be caring exclusively uh, about the American people. Um, and anything that we're doing should exclusively be from, from that lens. Um, I don't expect us to go around the world just like saving people writ large sure. and just like, you know, being this lovely, lovey dovey, what, whatever. Um, I think that everything is exclusively from the standpoint of, you know, okay, first do no harm. Sure. Um, but beyond not doing harm, our obligations are just to, to, to Americans. Um, I don't think that there's a benefit to the United States and to the American people, um, by being involved in Ukraine. I think there's a, a demonstrable harm in, in, in indeed, or in fact, whatever. You think there's a demar demonstrable harm to the United States yeah. people for being involved in Ukraine? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. How so? Um, well, so, there, okay. So there's, there's sort of two, there's sort of two thoughts that I'm having when you ask that question. First answer is like, I can answer it. The second point is that like, I don't think that I should be expected to answer it, if that makes sense, right? Because like the burden of proof is on you. If it make, uh, in terms of whether or not we should be involved in a conflict, right? The presumption is that we're not involved in a conflict. So, the, so, the, so the question of like, why shouldn't we be involved is a is a kind of strange like framing of a question. Um, we can start there. I can, I can answer it as well. But uh, but if you want, you you seem to disagree I, with that I, as a frame. Well, no, I I, th I, th I got a little bit of feedback from you. Um, I th I think that's kind of fair. Uh, but you did suggest that this be the topic. So, I, like I said, I didn't know where you're sure. coming from. With. Um, but okay. So this is, this is going to be, I think a fairly nuanced conversation rather than maybe a debate. Um, we'll, we'll argue of course, but I, I think there's, there's going to be points where we're agreeing, where we disagree. I don't think it's just going to be like blood sport here. Just want to get yeah, that for the, for the audience. So th what I, what I anticipate, um, what I expect the United States government to do is not just focus on short term issues. When it comes to implementing U.S. policy, whether that be within the domestic sphere or the foreign sphere. And the United States, since World War II, has been the buttress of the entire global system for the benefit of the United States and its people. Not just for because we have some sort of weird kind of connection to Europe because we're immigrants from Europe, ultimately, not because we're like... We're like, you know, the redheaded stepchild of, of, of Britain, right? It's not because of these things. It's because when World War II ended, the entire world was on the verge of another war due to uh, the position that Russia had. And so in our own interest, in order to have more markets to export to, in order to have stability in the world and not be dragged into another conflict, because it would happen, not e even even absent all kinds of uh, entanglements, treaties or what have you, right? It was in the American interest to do these things, right? Because if you, if you want to have people come to the United States to visit, if you want to have places to export, if you want to have goods and services come in and trade, you have to have a stable world. You can't have a stable world if things are going along the lines of uh, not just Western, because I'm not just a Western file. I, I think that there's been instances where the United States should have been involved in conflicts in, in Africa, uh, as well as Southeast Asia. So I, I supported, uh, I, I am a supporter of the Korean War, maybe not the way it was done, okay, but generally speaking, how, was, how uh, the, the conflict itself being involved there. 
not Vietnam. I feel like that was a, a complete shit show, and the consequences of that were were crap. Um, Darfur is another sorry. one. Uh, in your terms of your different difference between Vietnam and Korea, what's your what's your definite difference um, the, at the point that we joined, rather than in, in terms of obviously the consequences of it were different, but like at the point I that we joined, th- what was the difference? I think that we didn't properly balance what we thought our interests were with what they actually were. I think it was a an, a treaty obli- more of a treaty obligation towards uh, towards France than it was of stopping communism spread, and. I think that that was a more of an intelligence failure just in general of not understanding actually what the, the North Vietnamese wanted as far as a, a society. Um, and I, I think, honestly, I think the whole uh, domino theory was poor, poor analysis of how the world was going to go. Um, now, that said, Southeast Asia and China and Southeast Asia, specifically Korea um, and Russia playing in that that area due to global trade and the need to have the South China Sea open to trade that ends up having more of a strategic uh, importance for our ability for force projection into Southeast Asia in general. So that's why, you know, we still have Guam, right? Um, Guam is a, it's basically just a military, not just a military base, but that's essentially why the United States occupies it uh, more or less is because of the, of, of the Naval base. And it, that, having that ability to force project over to uh south china sea and the the pacific um and i think these are things that we actually should consider when we're talking about foreign policy and uh military uh intervention and military might or what have you so that's why in general i think yeah i think that's yeah i I think that i certainly think it's coherent i don't think that's like a a silly worldview um okay i'm gonna i'm gonna come at this from sort of a, a, a somewhat weird angle Um, But hear me out. Um, I don't think that America won the Cold War. I don't think Russia won the Cold War either, but I don't think that America (laughs) won the Cold War. I think the actual winners of the Cold War were Singapore, were India, were China, um, were all of these these powers, uh, South Korea, were these powers that were able to utilize this conflict between the, these two great powers um, to their own ends domestically. Yeah. So Singapore only exists as it exists today by virtue of it having a really good port. Remember that within living memory, they were getting like 300 GDP per capita um, dollars a year. Um, and at this point, it's, it's higher than the United States, right? Only slightly higher than the United States, but it's higher than the United States. Sure. Um, so that is a astronomical increase within living memory. Um, and it's because they have a good port, um, and it's because they're trading with China and they're they're trading with with the United States, and it's because uh, they they used to be trading with the USSR. It's because they've been able to become the sort of um, uh, the the port for all of Asia um, yeah. in a way that that very few other places have been able to do. Um, so I think they're the winner. Um, I think that when we talk about uh, how we got out of the Great Depression, the way that we did that was not by going into World War II. It was prior to World War II. It was, it was, it was the fact that we were selling uh, weapons to both sides. Now, I'm not saying that that was necessarily a moral thing to do. I'm not saying that there's, there's a moral equivalence, obviously, um, sure. between the Axis and the Allies. Um, but strictly from a, an American perspective, um, selling those weapons was great. If you look at you know, who among all of the places in all of, um, uh, of Europe, who got out of World War II looking the best off, it's pretty obvious that it's Switzerland, right? Switzerland, one of the very few places that wasn't involved in the whole thing, that was instead able to just protect its own borders, say, hey, you're not allowed to come in here. If you try to come in here, we will kill you. Um, and like, we will protect ourselves uh, to, the, to our last dying breath. But we're also not going to go and just like do whatever um, and try to attack France or try to attack Germany or whatever it might be. Sure. They're just not involved. Um, that strategic, um, military, uh, 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 disengagement, um, I think has served all of these countries quite well. And if you think about the uh, United States, even, um, you know, prior to world war one, we never really were this massive, um, military, uh, uh, power that was involved in all of these, these foreign conflicts. Um, and, you know, again, if you sort of zoom back even further, 
Um, or you, you disagree with that? Go for I it. I would disagree uh, at least partially. So the United States has always been a, I wouldn't say a superpower. That's very modern, right? But it's mm-hmm. always had very strong military uh, might uh, pretty much since its entire, its entire inception. Uh, that's because it is a, it is a former colonial power that had to expand and take the land over from a native population. Essentially what's happened, that's what happened. Every single time we've moved westward, we engaged in wars against native people. That created the uh, the training and the need to have armament, armaments in order to take over the rest of the country and, and, and get the resources therein. Then the Monroe Doctrine came into existence. That was, what, 1900-ish? Was that 1890? Some, exactly. Somewhere around there, right? Exactly. So it, the Moran Doctrine is basically like, we're going to control this entire hemisphere. Everyone else fuck off. And that's exactly what we did. We created a, a sophisticated military naval capacity in order to control the entire Western hemisphere. And we were responsible for forcing open the markets in Asia, um, for, for specifically for Japan, and help the Brits do the same thing for China. We were engaged in mercenary work within China to help suppress the various revolts there. And same thing happened with Japan and that we were forced to, we really literally showed up with a couple of, at the time, whatever the equivalent of the destroyer was. And it's like, open your ports or die. And they're like, uh, okay, I guess we're going to open our ports. Like this is literally what happened. And we yeah, forced I mean, them I, to take, take our textiles. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, I think that that's so, okay. Nothing that you just said there is, is, is incorrect. Um, but it's, I think, an emphasis that's an unfair emphasis. Um, like, in, in, in terms of our overarching uh, spending as, as a government, uh, the comparative proportion of spending that we, were, that we were spending then, comparative to now, is a very different amount of spending. Um, uh, when we think about sort of uh, how involved we were on the international stage, um, we were involved and have always been involved um, in trade um, at a high level. Uh, but we've not been involved at this at this right. military and, level. And I didn't mean to. I, I just didn't yeah. think it was fair to say that we weren't a military power just because we didn't engage yeah. in the wars in Europe. Like that's what sure, I was saying. I so we, we we suppressed so, yeah. we suppressed uprisings, created banana republics, literally like you know took over Haiti twice. Like these are things that we did that made us into a military power. And I think that yeah, that should I be agree. Said. We have certainly had a history of colonialism. Colonialism is complicated. Our own colonialism is complicated. Sure. The world's colonialism is complicated. Um, what we're doing in Russia and what we're doing in Ukraine isn't colonialism. What we're doing oh, in Russia and in, in, in Ukraine is much closer to a Cold War, is much closer to a proxy war. Um, yeah. I, I'm not, I, I just, I'm hesitant to call it a Cold War simply because the reason that the Cold War existed is because you had literally had two superpowers that everybody else went into for protection. Uh, you had, uh, or because they were dominated, right? Russia took over large, entire large swaths of territory. The United States essentially did the same thing to to beat to beat uh, the Germans, and they came together and like we're keeping all this territory because colonialism is based is the idea of thinking right essentially more or less and so we're going to keep this and uh you're not going to do anything and the the ideology that was there at the time was again domino theory's bullshit i don't think it should have been followed but it was a dominant ideology at the time so that's what created the impetus of the cold war what we have right now i wouldn't say it's cold war it's one rogue state against everyone else and then kind of other states how are you defining cold war well, cold the Cold War was uh, was literally okay, everybody. Not the cold War, just a Cold, cold War. Okay, so a Cold, cold War, war uh, happens yeah. when there's two superpowers vying over for whatever remaining bits of territory uh, or influence exist, um, and it's just two of them essentially. You can't you can't have it with there's three or four. Well, you can have it with three, but essentially you can't do it when there's more a multipolar kind of uh situation uh, i would say maybe three you could get away with once it gets to four or five it's when it starts to break down and you can't have that because sides will start playing off of each other it's okay why... so i would argue in eastern europe i would argue that we have a duopoly of power we have russia and we have nato yeah but it's literally um, not NATO the whole world an extension of the united states say it again I said it wouldn't be the whole world, like literally during the Cold War. Well, you can war, have a Cold War that's a, I mean, obviously I would say that Israel and Iran are in a Cold War, right? They're not literally mm-hmm. worldwide powers, either one of them. 
but they're both okay. clearly regional powers and I, they're I in think, a cold war i think that's fair and i think then we need to come up with a different term for the cold war it was similar to the Peloponnesian war during the greeks versus the spartans like it's the same sure. kind of situation that happened uh what we call that i don't know i just think that that should be like separated from what you're saying which yeah, is if a, you wanna, a if cold you want to talk about if you want to talk about like a, a regional um uh, conflict between two major powers that are using proxies as a separate thing than an internet a, a sort of global cold war because yeah. like, I, I agree that when we call, talk about the cold war it gives us this understanding of like a truly global situation yeah. um comparable to a world war um so in that sense i think that, that might be a, a, a reasonable point um so yeah let's just talk about it as a proxy war do you think okay, that, that russia you, that ukraine is a proxy war Okay. I, I would so I would say yeah. Just just to be clear, it it is a it is a proxy war. But what I don't agree with with other people, and I don't know if this is your position, I don't think the United States started that proxy war. I don't think the existence of NATO forced Russia to like invade or anything like that. Like I don't buy those arguments. I don't know if that's where you're coming from, but I don't. I want to put that out there just so that you understand where my position is, so that you don't like uh, argue in roundabout way <laughs> to get there anyway. Yeah, I don't care. I, okay. I I don't care who started it. Because I don't think that we that it's our issue, issue anyway. Right, right. I understand. You're more of a kind yeah. of a military isolationist person, more or less. It's not that I'm, yeah, I, I'm certainly not isolationist writ large. Like, I right. certainly think that we should be, um, you know, certainly trading with all of these co uh, countries, sure. um, uh, Russia included, by the way. Um, I, generally, uh, there, there, are, there, are, there are situations in which I think that that can be limited. Um, but broadly, we should be trying to have as an aim um, uh, a system wherein we're able to trade with the entire global economy. Uh, and we should be trying to gain a system wherein we're able uh, to have uh, friendly enough relationships with all of the powers that are relevant powers. Um, we are not in that situation uh, in relation to Russia. Russia no. is, is obviously a superpower, um, or at the very least a massive regional power. Um, and I'd say that's they, the, the latter, yeah. but yeah, just yeah, okay. like where my position sure. is, it's, it's fine. I just, yeah. Regional power. That's fine. But there, I mean, it's a region that matters a lot. Um, it's a region that has some of the most important natural resources in the world. Um, mm -hmm. it's a region that is strategically relevant, uh, in terms of, uh, larger and more global situations in relation to China. Um, it's a region that's going to be useful for a whole host of reasons. We don't want to be, um, getting into to, to sort of pissing matches um, with Russia. It's not a good thing to do. Um, so I guess the question is like, what are we, what are we getting out of um, putting our foot on the, in, in the ground and demanding whatever it is that we're demanding in relation to Ukraine? So it depends on how much weight you want to put on, um, for lack of a better term, morality in the current stabilized world order. If you are against the, well, I'm not saying you, yeah. I'm saying like yeah. in general. So um, for me, I very much like there are issues. Don't get me wrong. But generally speaking, I believe a, an, a world order where there is less hot war between major powers and one where we actually frown upon people taking over other people's territories is a good thing. I think that that actually helps deter people from actually trying to suppress or oppress or take over or colonize other countries for their benefit. And I think that if we have that stability, if we are able to counter any any kind of notion of when that happens, and again, don't get me wrong, the United States is guilty of this. I'm not saying that we are blameless, that we are the most moral of people ever. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if we are able to help a system be in place that does prevent some of these things from happening, that is a net benefit, not just to the United States, but the United States gets a major benefit from it, as well as the rest of the world. And I think there is a moral obligation to do some of these things when you have the ability to, and you're one of the only people that has an ability to. Otherwise, so should we be everybody... Involved in Ethiopia? Uh, should we be involved in Ethiopia? Um... Ethiopia is very complicated. If we could, yeah. st if we could stop, if if there is an actual genocide happening currently, which arguments can be made that it is, I think that we should be involved. We, being the international community, be involved in helping to stop that. 
I don't think it's this is something that the United States the United States alone should be playing world police. But well, I think but the United States be. is the one that's doing that in Ukraine. Sure. Right. It's not it's well, not the world who's doing it. It's the United States. If you look at the military uh, spending. But, okay, so that's the thing though. So anyone right. is spending nearly as much as we are. But, right. But is it actual spending that's happening or is it accounting? And I and I brought this up to some guy that randomly joined in the channel. A lot of the spending that's happening is literally, hey, this missile over here is worth a million dollars. That's a million dollars we're donating to Ukraine's cause or giving them that missile. Right. It's stuff like that. It's in kind donations. It's money that's already been spent that has or or it's a loan that's being given to Ukraine or another entity to buy those weapons from U.S. Man- weapons manufacturers. And then that loan has to be paid back in X number of years. Right. But if the, lo- the loan will fail to get be to get repaid unless we continue to loan them enough that they are able to maintain sure i, I don't discount that but, but we have to acknowledge it's we not... have to loan them <laughs> likely literally trillions of dollars um in order for for that loan to get returned yeah, it, also it's not all exclusively loans only some of it has been loans some of it's um, been loans some of it has been uh right. some of it has been direct cash payments some of it has been uh, in kind donations in terms of like actual military equipment stuff that we might decommission any a lot of stuff that we were going to decommission anyways uh, some of the other stuff that had to be repaired or replaced like these 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 this is the reality of the stuff that is yeah. going into Ukraine like we can't discount that so if the concern and I'm not saying this is your concern this is broadly speaking a lot of people are like well why are we giving them 140 billion dollars every like two weeks or whatever it is and not spending it on the United States I'm like well, how much of that is actually being given in the form of cash and how much of it's being given in the form of in-kind, well, essentially in-kind donation? Yeah, so I, mean, I think that matters. It, it matters kind of. There's a larger question of why the hell do we have so much military equipment that we're just able to throw around $196 sure. billion dollars worth of equipment and it's like... Whatever. <laughs> like that's, a, that's a larger question, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but I guess the, I guess my point about bringing up Ethiopia, and you could also bring up Yemen, which actually I think is probably a better uh-huh. example because it probably involves Saudi is. Arabia, um, and Saudi Arabia is, is objectively far, far, oh, far, yeah. far worse in a whole host of ways, um, certainly in a domestic capacity, than is Russia, and yet we're friends with Saudi Arabia and we're not yeah. friends with Russia, right? Yeah. So like, um, you know, it's clearly not some like moral stance that we're not willing to to be yeah uh, friendly with countries that are doing things as bad as russia is doing and that's so go ahead yeah, sorry go finish ahead. your point no go ahead finish so your i guess my, my 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 frustration is that we're not exactly being consistent when we say ukraine yes but yemen no i i would 100 percent agree with that we are not being consistent part of the reason we're not being consistent is because of the geopolitical realities in which we live So then and it's stuff that is starting to start to separate. Okay, so these are things that aren't going to be true maybe 10 years from now, maybe even five years from now. Hell, it might not be true in 2024. Okay, that's how much this is this not the world order is breaking because the world order is still there. But how much a realignment is happening between the parties that you said um, are trying to uh, do things that they want and play both sides of it. So with the Saudi Arabia example, right? We, we, mm-hmm. we have to acknowledge that in 1978 to uh, 1982-ish, or was it 76? Whatever, whenever the, the embargo happened because of our support for Israel, that put, us, that put our economy on not a death nail, but definitely bad footing, right? Since then, we had made it a, a determination to always be able to have access to oil markets in the Middle East. And in order to have access to oil markets in the Middle East, that means supporting at least partially what Saudi Arabia does and keep them keep our relationship in good standing with them. That alliance is starting to break down and that alliance is starting to break down because of the shale oil revolution in the United States. Sure. Also, the ability of us to export the shale revolution to other countries and that, that are more friendly and more ideologically on board with what we are, which is a democ- which is a more or less liberal democracy. So in two years, two to 10 years, Saudi Arabia may no longer be the, we may no longer have to have them as being part of our, uh, our circle of influence in order to have access to those markets. But that's a recent thing. And that recent thing is starting to break down along ideological lines in the United States, which I think is what ultimately put them on the back footing. 
Same so with Russia. Russia has been an ideological foe of the West, generally speaking, for hundreds of years for various different reasons. And if you're worried and you take history into effect and you take this kind of real politic lens of viewing the world, anytime Russia moves westward, they're going to end up trying to march on Germany. That's just what's happened forever, right? Now, I don't necessarily agree with this, okay? But this is the worldview that has perpetuated this thing and brought us to where we are here. And when they when they've moved into uh, Ukraine in 2012, yeah, 2012. Uh, before that, was it Moldova was 2006? Moldova 2006? Ignore the years. The years don't matter. Point is, is that Moldova, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, uh, partially Belarus because of their alliance with them. And um, oh, there's another there's another tiny part of another country that's a former Eastern Bloc that's under Russia occupation. Uh, but I can't remember the name of it. That is them moving westward towards Poland, and we can't have that. <laughs> so the point of NATO being in existence is showing up with Putin and his idea of wanting to be a, uh, the, you know, one of the greats, quote unquote, making Russia great again. The original, original saying. Um, that's cause for concern. And so I think okay, so, being able to stop yeah, that ahead. is in the United States interest. But we but we can talk about that later. Yeah. So, OK. The reason that we need to spend $196 billion, um, and we've just increased the amount that we're, that we're willing to spend, Biden just, just passed earlier this week, um, that's going to be even more than that. Um, the reason we just need to spend all of this money, um, almost certainly if this continues, which it probably will, upwards of a trillion dollars in total eventually um, in, in this Ukraine uh, conflict, um, is going to be because we need to protect Poland. Because we need to protect the current world order that is slightly realigning, but still is very much in the liberal vein from the, this is not domino theory, but from other countries being invaded and taken over and suppressed in order to when keep the markets liberal, open and everything else. Okay. When you say liberal, you mean open markets. You don't mean I, I what's mean, happening. Domestically. I'm saying again, I didn't hear you. You don't mean what's happening domestically in terms of the way that there are um, no. you know, treating their uh, people, you just mean uh, internationally, whether or not they're able to trade. I think it's both, um, but more so trade and, okay. and partially at least democracy, uh, to an extent. Why? Why do we want that? Yeah. Why does democracy outside of the United States have any relevance to the people? I think the it States? helps create a, create a more stable world and that therefore benefits the United States. Democracies so go to war with each other the, less. The democracy in so the democracy in and of itself is not the relevant component. What's relevant is the stability. No, I, 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 way to get for, for me, for me, democracy is relevant, but I'm not. But if we're talking about what is actually happening no. <laughs> so for me, my argument would be, yes, demar- democracy is based. We should encourage it to happen. We should stop other countries from invading democracies when we can because of the impact that has on the global system as well as uh, as well as the United States itself from a moral ideological perspective. That's me. But what we're actually doing is we're stopping the invasion of an illiberal uh, society, an autocratic society from moving in a traditional Western foe from moving in and encroaching on more Western territory. They would end up closing those markets to us and making our, our lives worse off overall because of the, the war and destruction that happens and closing off those markets. The Russian territory, or excuse me, the, the Western territory you're speaking of um, is Poland or it's Ukraine? I would say it's any, any, well, anybody that's not directly, maybe not even Western, it's a quasi proto democracy that is friendly to the United States and the West. Okay. So when you say friendly, um, what do you mean by friendly? What is it? What is a friendly country? Trade, like? trade relations with the United States, general good relations, diplomatically, um, the, their, their so willingness to... Saudi Arabia is mostly friendly. There's some factions in there that are not, and that's starting to break. Right, but they're basically friendly. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to get to a point where we're friendly with Russia. And I think that's a noble goal. I don't Saudi think that's. Arabia. I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat yourself? I talked over you. I want to be friendly to Russia in the same way that I'm friendly with Saudi Arabia. I want to be able to say on the international uh, stage as a human being that what I think you're doing is absolutely atrocious and that you are going to. Be condemned to hell and blah 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 and here's why 
um, but I don't ultimately want to be involving myself either with their domestic conflicts um, or trying to uh, do something at the international scale um, by wielding American uh, power uh, mm -hmm. in order to stop them, um, because I think that that's not something that is within the purview of the United States. So I will agree with you partially and disagree with you partially. And this is where our, our ideologies are, are going to butt heads. So mm -hmm. it's a noble goal to be willing to want to be able to openly trade and have diplomatic relations with every single nation on, the, on Earth and stay out militarily. That's a noble goal. I don't think that's possible. And the reason I don't think that's possible is because ultimately, when it comes down to it, if you are if no country gets involved when another country invades country and that country is weaker then that does embolden other countries to take over territory and to start to break down the world order that is built around currently uh more or less some sort of form of liberalism uh, whether it's democratic liberalism market liberalism it's still liberalism it's still a decent kind of a system where yes there is evil and atrocious things done in the world but that is going to be worse if countries are openly invading each other for resources uh trade markets etc and i think that that is where we disagree because to me okay let's... that is bad for us and that is why we should be doing this absent the moral arguments even even though i agree with the moral arguments I'm going to give a extreme hypothetical that I want you to sort of play with. Um, to be clear, I'm not actually advocating for this extreme hypothetical. Um, yeah. But let's suggest that instead of spending almost a trillion dollars uh, a year, which is what we just agreed on, it was 831, I believe, billion dollars a year. Uh, Biden just passed. Um, uh, instead of instead of spending that on military, let's spend close to zero. Um, so Panama Canal, we're no longer in, con in control. Um, Suez Canal, we're no longer in control. Mm -hmm. um, our, our, our bases in Germany, we no longer have them. We just sell them off and they become houses or whatever. Um, we get rid of Guantanamo. We get rid of all of our shit that we have in Ukraine. We get okay. rid of all of our shit that we have in blah, 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 everywhere. So, so we take all the military down to whatever it just needed to defend domestically. Whatever it needed to defend domestically, the okay. United States. Everything else, we're, uh, we're gone. All right. I'm going to propose what I think is going to happen. Um, to fulfill to fill that power vacuum, um, and I want to see where you disagree. Mm -hmm. Okay, Suez Canal, China is going to take over. Panama Canal, China is going to take over. Mm -hmm. um, Panama is going to kind of take over allegedly, um, but in the same way that the Suez Canal is hypothetically not ours um, because it's allegedly controlled by the Egyptians, but it's actually controlled by us in that we are the ones who are able to put our military um, vessels through it first, um, and we, we get to cut the line. Sure. I think that China is going to be able to cut the line in the Suez Canal. I think China is going to be able to cut the line in uh, in the Panama Canal. As a result, result of that, the Nicaragua uh, Canal is going to stop being made. Uh, or, uh, I think that we're going to have, um, you know, massive uh, implications on uh, in terms of um, our ability to spend lo uh, uh, not locally, but but uh, in, in, internally. Right? We're going to be able to now have universal health care. We're now going to be able to actually fund uh, infrastructure. We're going to actually be able to fund uh, kindergarten. We're going to be actually able to fund blah, 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 because so, we have an extra trillion dollars lying around. So, right? So able to. But not necessarily doing it. Is that that's the contention? Um, sure. Even if we don't, okay. though, we're still going to have another trillion dollars sloshing around in our economy, and that extra trillion dollars in our economy will still be benefiting us. So even if we were to do very stupid things domestically, um, we would still be doing something domestically, and that something that we'd be doing domestically would almost certainly uh, create more than a trillion dollars uh, in, in in GDP increase uh, locally. I, I, that's where I, I, I disagree. I think what would end up happening is that the uh, current systems that are sucking up that money will look for uh, abilities to uh, use that money to invest overseas. And so what I think will end up happening is that our military manufacturing sector that it once was getting money from us is going to start getting money from other places. And that will increase uh, trade, potentially increase trade deficits uh, in a roundabout way, potentially, not necessarily. Um Probably so I just want to make, not, yeah. not as much as I was just thinking of um, and I'm going through my head because it's so much money that it might actually end up being it might be a wash. It might be a wash uh, with the trade deficit. thing. So I just, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. You're suggesting that all of our military contractors are going to start working for Europe and start working for China. 
I, it's not that they'll start working for Europe and China. It's that they, they will end up wanting to, they will end up trading with those people. And those mm -hmm. people will have leverage because they're the only sure. people buying weapons. And that will be in the currency that they have. So they'll be in the Euro and in the, the international Yuan. I don't remember what it's called, but it's a different currency than the, the local one. Or is it? Yeah. Well, the reason that people use the dollar as the default currency is because of the strength of the dollar. So the reason that the dollar makes sense is because it's considered to not be something that's going to lose its value over time. Yeah. The fact that we're trillions and trillions of dollars in debt is definitely hurting the, the, the strength of that dollar, right? No. The reason that it is used is because it is literally the dollar of exchange. It is literally the monetary uh, point of exchange because we mm -hmm. established Bretton Woods and made it and used it to establish the current world order that we're in. And everybody has to. It is used as the medium of exchange because it's how the system is built. Anything that's traded between countries is gone through dollars because that's the system that is being used. That's what the SWIFT system does. It allows people oh, you to mean exchange. In terms of exchange, sure. I don't yeah. care about exchange, though. I care exchange about exchange. Exchange matters. Why? Because the exchange is what creates the, the demand for the currency. No, reserve that, is. No, I don't, I don't agree with that. Yeah, now, now, I don't know why I can't agree with that, um, but I, I, from, from my understanding of monetary policy and global international trade, it's not reserves that create that demand. It is the fact that they have to. And so they build up the reserves in order to meet those exchange goals. And those exchange goals are done because of the system that we have implemented. All right, we're getting to, to, to the weeds it's on currency. So I get much weeds. weeds, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but okay, so so let's just like zoom back out to the the matter of um, international development. So okay, um, we have a bunch of money sloshing around now. Um, I would like to propose a different way of spending it. One of the ways that we should spend it is similar to the way that China is spending in in, in Africa. We should spend it in South America. Um, we should be okay. uh, uh, getting a bunch of of of, of uh, resource rent. Um, deals with a bunch of, of, of low income na uh, nations across mm -hmm. uh, across South America, um, and we should get to so to create uh, create their ports. We should be mm -hmm. thereby getting really good deals on those ports. We should be building them, blah blah blah, all of these different things that are going to um, speed line their de development um, and put us in the driver's seat in relation to getting some portion of that of that money. I also think we should be doing that in Africa. I also think we should be doing that in Asia. Um, but, the reason, but I think primarily we should be doing South, uh, South America. Yeah. I, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, I am, I, again, uh, for people that do not know me, I do not consider myself a leftist. I consider myself a sock den with an internationalist bent. Uh, that international sure. bent is liberal. Um, so that's what it, that's the way it is. Democratic peace theory, uh, free trade peace theory, that is what I, I subscribe to because it's proven over time to be mostly true. Um, with that said... Um, the reason that China is doing those things isn't because they want money back. <laughs> they want to be able to establish force projection places to mm -hmm. do these things. So sure. where is the incentive for us to do that without the force projection? In well, order to, force, projection. To, force projection isn't just strictly militaristic. Well, it, but it, 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 that's ultimately why they're doing it. They want to be able to have a no. military... No, it's not. No. If you look at the if you look at the spending of of, of China versus the United States, like I did, I did uh, for I, I have a minor um, in cybersecurity and national conflict, um, uh, and for it, I I, I did a um, uh, a piece um, uh, on Djibouti um, and mm -hmm. the comparative spending between China and the United States. Um, and so, what we spent our money on was we have a, we have a base in in Djibouti, right? Um, but comparatively, um, uh, what China's spent their money on uh, is they have gotten a really, really good streamlined road system um, mm -hmm. and train system uh, that connects to a port that they partially own. Um, that's able to connect them to the the, the center of Africa, um, mm -hmm. the in, 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 interior of Africa, um, and they're able to pull out a massive amount of of, of oil and gas. They've been able to uh, pull out a massive amount of natural resources um, by they, virtue of that, and they've been able to do these amazing trades that have yes. have you know been a huge benefit to their economy in a way that we have not benefited by what, virtue of that that military. What happens when said mm -hmm. countries decide economic hitman is real and we're being fucked over? And they nationalize everything and kick China out. Why would that be in their interest? It would be in their interest eventually because they are being there. It's not right now, but ultimately a lot of people end up getting a hair up their ass and want to control things. 
So that is, mm-hmm. I think it is an eventuality that people end up becoming uh, resentful of the people that are in control of things when they should, when they feel like they should be. Um, now China's doing it better than we do. They're playing go. We play chess. It's a different game. Okay. For everybody out there, that's a good game analogy. If you don't know what go is, look it up. It's great. Uh, it's very much more strategic. We're playing go. I, we're playing checkers. I don't think we're playing chess. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, given our political system instability, maybe, maybe, but the, the yeah. point still stands, right? Like strategic military strategy thinking like with with go, it's like surrounding territories and cutting it off and like doing these things and and getting territories, not attacking where chess it's attacking. You're always attacking. Um, so that's a different it's a different mindset. Right. Um, shogi, 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 shogi is similar to chess, but you can like convert people, which makes which makes more subterfuge things. Anyways, weeds doesn't matter. Might do an episode about it. Um but <laughs> but I think eventually uh, people will end up becoming resentful and want to take back control of power, especially if they feel like they're being taken advantage of. And I think that China right now is not. But once those loans become due, um, then uh, and it's in their interest to they'll start doing that. And I think that's a, a inevitability of any type of colonialism, which is what economic hitman is, you know, making a, a nation go into debt building up things for its infrastructure for your own benefit and then calling those those loans due um also when china does um does spending they're inherently doing less of it when they do these things than the united states does because they export their own labor force their excess men to go do these jobs uh to get them integrated into the community and they spend less on it because it's less money for them to spend than u.s doing it with usaid which uses american contractors for american uh, cost of yep. labor so sure. just another thing to okay, have to so take yeah, into account. No, you're, you're totally right. That's that, that particular that last point was, it was a fair one. Um, okay. So uh, there's a couple of things that, that brings up. The first thing is that um, at least in the case of Djibouti um, and at least in the case of Sudan, um, uh, Af- uh, China's already made their money back uh, and then some, right? So like, it's not a matter of okay. like, even if, even if tomorrow um, they were kicked out and, you know, everything they just were told to go to hell, they would already have made money back. Um, so they definitely have been able to do that. Um, but the broader thing is that you presume they're going to get kicked out at some point and that they're going to somehow like stop being allowed to trade with those countries. But I mean, we are responsible basically single-handedly as a nation for making Japan what it is today. We're basically responsible for making South Korea what it is today. Um, and I see no reason that they are in foreseeable future, either one of them, going to stop trading with the United States. Because it is strictly good for them to trade with the United States. Um, like, we have built them into this powerhouse where they used to mm-hmm. not be a powerhouse. And that's great for us. Like, sure, it's also good for them. But, like, You're... the the problem with the sort of the, the, the realist um, approach mm-hmm. is that, like, it's simply wrong that, you know, strengthening China is strictly bad for the United States. Militaristically, that's true. But financially, it's not. When we think about like how we've been able over a period of basically just a single generation to like cut poverty in a third, how sure. we've been able basically in a single generation to like cut starvation in a third, um, how we've been able to do so much on disease control and blah 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 mm-hmm. blah blah blah. Like yeah, these are all, all moral goods in yeah, a grand course, scheme of things. One hundred percent, absolutely, they are. Um, but the way we've been able to do that is because we're all like Trading. a rising tide you know, raises all boats, right? And, and that system of trade, mm-hmm. that system of, um, uh, of, of resource interaction um, between nations, I think is how you get there. Um, and what we're doing in Ukraine is actively hurting that capacity. If we were instead, you know, trying to figure out ways and had been for a long time um, of, of uh, building a Russian economy that number one was stronger than the Russian economy is currently, and number oh, two was more, yeah, taken uh, more yeah, intertwined yeah. With, with the Western economies and more intertwined with the Chinese economies and more intertwined with the African economies, sure. uh, we'd be in a better place right now because I, the I, truth I, is that like Russia, like, you know, we were talking earlier when, when you were, when you were streaming and you're talking about, um, uh, what's her name? Brittany Griner, right? Right. Yeah. Um, uh, I, you know, this, the reason that something like that is able to happen is because like we have, like Britain is not going to do that. Right. Spain is not going to do that because they do can't what exactly. I'm sorry. 
hold an American okay. citizen hostage for ransom. Gotcha, gotcha. Because, because like they understand that are we going to go to war over one WNBA player um, in order to like get her out of no, jail but we'll with Britain? Cut of course ties not. We're not going to do with Russia. We're not going to do with Qatar. We're not going to do with Saudi yeah. Arabia. But we are going to do the kinds of of trade hardball. Um, uh, but but above board kind of interactions um, that we often do. The problem is that we've done all of those on Russia. And by virtue of that, we're not able to like, there's nothing else that we can do. Like the and, difference between spending $196 billion a year, yeah. uh, a year trying to fuck them versus $396 billion a right. year trying to fuck them. It's just not that big of a deal. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's not that big of a deal, right? I, the, yeah. the frustrating thing about this is that I, I don't disagree with you. I just disagree of what we can do now. So if we if in the 90s we we're like hey let's uh let's let's integrate Russia more right if we in the 90s we said hey let's integrate Russia more let's not do the colon- the economic hitman colonialism thing where we send off businessmen to like just wreck not wreck but like take over as much of the Russian economy as we can and extract as many resources from that as we can we would be in a complete we would likely be in a completely different place potentially because we did similar because what you're talking about is what we did with China, right? We opened trade relations. We integrated them into the WTO. We tried to uh, you not use China. Well, yeah, use China as a buttress against Russia from the east. Right. Essentially is what we did. Right. And China right now has a person that wants to re-implement the Chinese vassal empire and do things like invade other countries in order to bring it about its own glorious past back into existence because of one basically egomaniac. That's why we have that. And it's not the only reason there's cultural things, you know, Tibet happened in the nineties before Xi Jinping, right? Like, but, but that's what, what's happening, right? They want to have the great Chinese empire to exist. And with those things is why some of these tensions are happening. It's not because of like the United States is just like super scared of a rising China military that's going to come up and punch us in the face. It's because China is actually moving in on ter- on on these things into what is American interest and also doing so from uh, on its borders militarily and joining forces with Russia of against an American an aggressive American bloc. That's the reality that we're in. If we didn't want uh, if we didn't have a more aggressive posture after the uh the cold war ended after the fall of the Berlin wall 92 we might be in a different world and your your desire might be the actual best thing to do that's What's not what the... we have and okay describe describe singapore's situation right now so singapore's situation right now is a combinate is was their ability uh more or less is what you said they were able to play all sides against each other to build up a giant port city that gives everybody access to all of asia essentially right um, they were a, they were protectorate under the Britain, British empire. Am I right about that as well? Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that included some of that. I don't, they weren't given back to China, unlike Hong Kong. I think it, they got, they, they did. No, they, they, right? they weren't independent. They, they were, um, uh, a part of, um, uh, Indonesia, I believe for yeah. a, long, a long time. Yeah. Um, there were they some were other empire, but they weren't given yeah. back over to China. Like Hong Kong was right. For example. Um, so that able that allowed. I'm sorry, them. I said Indonesia. I meant Malaysia. Yeah. Okay. Um, they were part of Malaysia for a while, and then they they were able to break free from Malaysia and sure. become their own independent country. Yeah. So so th- so they were able to parlay all all those things into the position that they are now, and they they hyper um, capitalized. I guess is a good way to say it. They they had a combination of capitalistic open free markets with extreme social programs, and I mean extreme sure. by our standards. For people that may not know, they literally built government housing for everybody and integrated racial ethnic minorities everywhere. They yeah, <laughs> like, I, 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 just to clarify, they didn't do a perfect job of that. There no, were definitely no. problems with that. There, but, there's but, yeah, problems with it, but it but that, that helped but yeah. cement it to be a more cohesive country, uh, despite the fact that it's hodgepodge. Not and it's not perfect. Don't get me wrong. Um, you can quibble about it. I, they, they did a lot on housing is, yeah. is what I'll say. The, the racial component of what they did on housing is a lot more mixed bag than I think you're getting. Okay. Credit for, but that's a different conversation entirely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so when I think about like Singapore's relationship to all of these power games that are going on between Russia and China and the United States, 
Um, and we can throw India in there as well. Um, like, Singapore strictly wins. No matter who wins that, that fight, mm -hmm. the fact that there is a fight going on, that, that fight is continuing, and the fact that that fight is manifesting um, in the, all of us trying to look at third powers um, as a vessel uh, to, to further our interest against one another, um, that's strictly good for Singapore. It's strictly good for South Korea. It's strictly good for New Zealand or, or any number of places. Um, and, and so, I mean, like I, I guess, like, uh, there, like, if we're thinking about security and, and safety, um, there's, sort of, there's sort of two layers to it. There's a layer which is like, how, how hard would it be for someone to mess with us? But there's a second layer which is like, how much do people want to mess with us? Like, I think about, okay, um, the Iron Dome exists and protects all of Israel, right? Um, and so if there is a terrorist um, who, is, who is living in, um, in Gaza and wants to attack uh, 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 Israel, they're likely to get shot down by the Iron Dome. Yeah. Okay, if there is a terrorist who lives in Monroeville and wants to attack, or, or lives in Braddock and wants to attack Pittsburgh, like, I'm fucked, right? Like, I don't have an iron dome to protect me. Right. But there's a difference, right? I'm still safer in Pittsburgh from, 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 the, from the, the terrorist attacks um, and, and the missiles being shot from Braddock than the people in Tel Aviv are, are protected from the people of Gaza. Because there's an undergirding reality that there is a reason, that there is a massive um, uh, desire within Gaza to attack Tel Aviv. Um, and so when we think about, like, that component of safety, like, no one is going to go do terrorism against New Zealand because who the hell cares about New Zealand, right? No one does. Well, no one is going and, and attacking like I mean, all Christ of these Church. <laughs> Sure, okay, but like it's not. It's not like it's not ISIS. international. I get it's it. It's not like Al Qaeda. It's not like it, this is like a primary driving component, right? Of it, the like international said, terrorism ring, right? We we agree on this component. I think that the military yeah. that the U.S. is too involved. Uh, militarily across the across the globe uh, for various different reasons some historic some ideological driven some just you know parties change and somebody got a hair up their ass right i think iraq was a hair up george bush's ass like that's how i view iraq i don't feel like it was in our interest to do it i think we could have if we pulled back from our hatred of iran right if we pulled back from that a bit we could have integrated iraq and iran to like be a better better block against saudi arabian aggression from other places like I, I these are things that we could do we didn't and because we didn't do them we have problems and that's the same thing that's going on with russia we didn't integrate russia into the general economy that has been a very big gripe from a lot of real politic people including i want to say um uh kissinger like say what you want about the man kissinger being evil he's smart as hell read his fucking books please if you're a lefty, you have to read his books to understand how these people think, right? Even he said we should have integrated Russia better into the global economy, the global, the 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 whatever liberal -esque, esque world order that we had, and not try to basically colonize them or allow big businesses to do do it for our bidding, right? But we didn't do that, so now we have a reality of Putin being in Russia, wanting Russia to basically break the shackles of the West, loading lording over it. And seeing any kind of encroachment into Russian sphere of influence, even if it's at the request of the citizens of those countries, as a danger directly to Russia. And so that's why Putin invaded. But because Putin invaded because of those desires, he became the aggressor. And from a moral perspective, he should get fucked. <laughs> and that's where I'm coming from this. Yeah, I just don't care about like this, this like this this moral perspective thing. It's just it's weird to me. I don't like that's just not my. It's not our job as the United States it, to like it is, be the moral arbiters of it, of like. It isn't. I don't think it's action. just the United States' job in this. In my ideal world, every single country that isn't an autocrat in a country would be doing everything they can to stop Russia's winning in Ukraine. Every country. So Germany would be giving more money. New Zealand would be giving more money. Japan would be giving more money. South Korea yeah. would be giving more money. Everybody would be involved because everybody should realize that when a country is invaded by another country and that country, especially if that country is nascent democratic, 
It is bad for everybody else that's nascent and democratic. And you create as large of a block as possible to stamp that shit out so nobody feels like they should do it again. That is my ideal world. We're not there because for a variety of different reasons. There's people with your your ideology in every single country. And I'm not saying your ideology is bad. I'm saying that's part of the reason why this is this exists. It's not my problem. Yeah, so, so, I mean, fuck okay. It. <laughs> so, OK, I guess. OK, like, OK. Um, I agree with you to an extent. Um, my comparative would be this. Uh, there's a crisis of wa- there's a water crisis in Flint, Flint, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, it is obviously the job of the United States government, the, the, the national government of the United States, to be a part of the solution to that problem. Um, okay. Uh, Pittsburgh is a richer and better off city than Flint, Michigan. Okay. I would uh, be incredibly upset with Ed Gainey. I was about to say something uh, more, more dire than that, but I'm not going to say the more dire version of it. I would be very upset with Ed Gainey, um, and I certainly wouldn't vote for him again, um, if the mayor of Pittsburgh decided that he was going to um, give my local tax dollars that should be going to my local schools, should be going to my local education, should be going to my local you know, bridges and, and, and roads and blah, 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 all of police, sure. fire, whatever it is. Um, if he spent that fixing the problems of Flint, Michigan, even if the problems in Flint, Michigan are more dire than the problems in, in, in Pittsburgh, because we still have very real problems in Pittsburgh. And, um, and I, th- I think so, when it comes to yeah. war, there's a different calculus that's there because well, it impacts well, so, so everybody. If I can, if I can finish it. Yeah. Um, that said, um, it is still the job of, of the United States government. It's the job of this, inter, uh, of, of this inter-city network that is mm-hmm. the state and this interstate network that is the, 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 the federal government. Um, to, to fix those problems that happen in Flint, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you were pointing at the United Nations and you were saying, hey, the UN should be strengthened. Hey, the UN should be doing blah, 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 blah. It should actually have teeth to it. It should actually have you know, the capacity to actually uh, lead. Um, I wouldn't think that that's crazy. Increasingly, the EU is serving basically as a single uh, military power. Um, it's serving basically as, as a single um, economic even power um, in a lot of ways. It has basically open borders across the board. It has basically um, uh, it has a single currency across the board. It's got like all of these things that are that are um, encouraging uh, its member states um, to yes be still serving the interest of their individual member state, um, but still be able to be part of this larger network mm-hmm. that is able to maintain interest at a at a collective level. Sure. Um, I don't think that's crazy. Um, we are talking about a, um, uh, a sort of a, a, a global uh, government. Um, sure. I am recogni- recogni- I recognize obviously <laughs> that I am a Jew talking about a global government, um, <laughs> and I, I should be uncomfortable with that fact. Um, but uh, I don't think that that's like wildly absurd. It's obviously not where we live currently, sure. and what is what happening currently is that New York. Right, the, the the richest and and largest, biggest bully of cities in the United States um, is going around and just they're not like fixing the Flint uh, water crisis. They're yeah. just straight up like taking water from Flint and just right. being like, ha ha, fuck no, you. No, you know, I, like this this is why we we agree way more than we disagree. It is, but when we're talking about this particular situation, y- you you can't look at it in a vacuum. But you have to fix this particular situation. You know, you know what I'm getting at, like. All these no, other I don't things. Agree. You, as if, if, if by you you mean the United States, need to fix the situation. I don't agree with you. The United States does not have to fix the situation. I think it's like I said. It, I believe it is the entire world's obligation to fix this. I but just, you're not talking to the entire entire world. I, there I know is I'm no entire talking. world to talk yes. to. And the United you're States, to America, or you're not talking. Yeah, that's the that's the problem. That's the world in which we exist in, right? And so sure. if if we if we, we can acknowledge that we are in that world and if we pull back from that world, as you said, other powers will swoop in and that is going to have deteriorous impacts on the United States that I am not comfortable with. I, I if if the United States pulls completely back and just disentangles, that's going to be more war. More war is not going to be to the United States interest because the entire global system is, it- is based on the United States. 
And that, that entire instability is going to end up impacting the United States and our citizens. It is a broader view of what our interests are, given how the world operates as it is today. All there right, needs I'm to be a more peaceful a, disentanglement from this, and I feel like that's where we, we I'm gonna give probably a guess. agree. <laughs> Here's my guess. I have two guesses of what's going to happen. I think if tomorrow America just said, okay, we're done with Ukraine, um, uh, bye, we're, we're, we're out, um, Russia, do your thing, uh, I think that what would happen is that in a period of less than a year and a half, uh, Ukraine would fall to to Russia. I think that yes. Russia would fold Ukraine into uh, into the uh, into its country. Um, I think within uh, a period of five years, um, all of the um, major um, civil war fighting would stop. Right, the uh -huh. government would fall in a year and a half, but I think all the the civil war squabbles would would stop in five years. Yeah, there there, um, there would be there would be yeah, there would be an insurgency for a bit, and yeah, you're right for a bit, but eventually yeah. Russia would take control. And then we would get back to stability with all of, uh, of currently Ukraine being part of Russia. Um, that's also, my guess within five years. I also believe there would be a, a, a genocide campaign. I think that that's actually what, what would be happen. a genocide against who? The Ukrainian, the ethnic Ukrainians. By the uh, Russians, potentially. Why do you say that? Uh, some of the language, like, I don't like to base everything just based on what people say, because it's a lot of hyperbole, especially when you have nationalistic, uh, tendencies that are going on. That's always going to happen during a war, but there's been a, there's been human rights violations and targeting, targeting, uh, attacks on Ukraine. And some of the people in power have said, including Putin said that the Ukrainian ethnic identity doesn't actually exist. It's a, it's a, uh, aberration of history because Lenin was an idiot. Basically, I don't know if he said Lenin or if he said Stalin. He said somebody was dumb and uh, that's the only reason why they have a, a national identity and they should be they should be welcomed back in as a minor Russian ethnic uh, or if not that, then outright uh, decimated. And when you create a when you go after their ethnic identity, that is genocide. Yeah, I don't think this is defensible as a stance. There are, there are lots of different ethnic minorities across Russia. Um, many of them have autonomous, uh, approximately autonomous regions. Um, sure. There are, uh, but I, I don't have. They just don't have. A, they don't have this history. I, I, just I, I again, valid. like I said, this is the language they've been using, so that's a concern that I have, specifically because of where Putin is right now. Would it actually yeah. happen? I don't know. I do believe there would be more fair, human like rights it. violations. I mean, that's fine. I, we can agree to disagree on that. Well, it's not that. I mean, like. We can, but the reason I'm believing this is because I think that I'm basing it out of no, I, what I, Putin I is currently you. doing with lots of ethnic minorities sure. across this entire country. Um, but they're, they're subdued, right? Say it so again. they're subdued. For, for they're, they're, they're fully subdued, right? And how did they get fully subdued? What do you mean by they're fully subdued? Well, they, they, they uh, basically are... Um, not, I'm not going to say oppressed because I don't know the in and outs of everything that happens in Russia, uh, but they've been, um, they've had their, they're not, they haven't had their ethnic identity wiped out, but they've had it, their nationalistic ethnic identity subsumed into the Russian sphere. Would you say that's true? They have become Russian, yes. Y yeah, more Russian more or less, right? So how... They, would, they continue to be ethnically they, different than... They, Right, but they're still Putin, they're, but they are Russian. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's how they're being. But there are but Russians they, who look Chinese. There are yes, Russians. No, no, who look, I, right. Like, I get there's that. lots of Russians. But with the language that Putin has been using, I don't know if there would be ethnic cleansing or if there would be a genocide. I just know that he said that they shouldn't exist. So that's why my concern is there well, he because said he said that in the context of he doesn't believe the Ukrainian government should exist. Did he say that in that context? Yeah, it, it, I, I don't think that like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that we have good evidence to believe, um, like even in terms of what's going it's on. It's possibly in Crimea, a terrible mistranslation job. And I'm just basing this off of like somebody's misinterpretation because one word means the same thing three different ways or something. I, I again, it's a concern. Yeah. I don't necessarily know if it's going to happen, but I think that there, the, I the, think that it's a, the human to yeah. to toil that will happen on this is, uh, is not something that we should, even absent of a of a genocide and ethnic cleansing. I think that the human toll that this happens is going to be very bad. We okay, so there. bad bad human hope tolls. Um, here's a uh, different guess of a thing that's going to happen. Um, 
Putin, I don't think, can surrender. I think literally he will die if he surrenders uh, in Ukraine. Um, so I don't think he will ever surrender um, in his, his, his fight in Ukraine. Okay. Um, first, do you agree with that? Uh, I think he's probably only got like five years left in him anyways. So, but yes, I think that um, if he surrenders, but if he somebody, Ukraine, he will die. somebody is going to get, a, get the wild hair up their ass and they'll see his weakness and try to take over. Uh, coup or something will happen. Yeah, I, I do think okay. that's, that's so, ultimately so what will happen. Putin literally cannot leave Ukraine. Sure. Okay. Um, I bet that uh, if we don't leave, that this war will wage on for significantly more than five years. I don't think so. I think, but I, I also don't think that we're going to end up staying um, all that much longer. So my, my position on this is that the Europe, like this is what I've said, the Europeans have to survive through the winter and then use those gains that the Ukrainians have made based on all the, the money and equipment and everything they've gotten. If they can also, if they can gain more territory during the winter, then that's going to be super good. And <laughs> it's going to put them in a more, in a, in a better leverage position. But I think if they survive through the winter, everybody's going to push for an end to the war, including Ukraine. I think if they survive through the winter and they're able what to is, make what does an end to the war look like? What does I that think mean? The, I think an end to the war in that scenario where it's not a Putin has to die situation because I don't know if, how many people actually believe that. Um, I think what it what it looks like is possibly a small land bridge to Crimea, and that's it. I think that's what it. I think that's probably that is the more likely scenario of any territory being lost and Putin being able to declare a win. That's the golden bridge, but it has to be a small sliver of territory. It cannot be the entire Donetsk region. And you think that the United States would be okay with that? I think ultimately the United States and Europe would be okay with that because it is a it is you a think victory. that Zelensky would be okay with that? I don't know if Zelensky would be okay with that. I can't. So we have to kill Zelensky. Do. I don't think we'd have to kill Zelensky. Well, if we stop, if has we to be okay with that, if he's not okay with it, if, the war is going to continue, we, right? If we push, if we push for if if we push for these things and then say we're this is where our our stance is and then pull the money out i think that he might ultimately agree with it but i think that's i don't think that should happen i think that's probably what's going to and that's why i don't want to re- leave right now personally because i think if we stopped it today that that goes out the window and then they lose yeah i i, I honestly i think that that's just a it's cool. very <laughs> Say it again. It's cope. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It's. I it, agree. It's, I, mean, I think that the chances of that happening are approximately the same chances of like because of the know, Nikki they, Haley becoming our next president. Like I, it I, could I, happen. <laughs> it's not I, I think. I think. It could. I think the Ukrainians and Russians can, with our support, fight to a stalemate. That will ultimately have to have this decided. But if we pull out and stop giving them money. Then it collapses. And yeah, I don't think I mean, that's, that's in Russia our interest to do so. Af- Russia was involved in Afghanistan, and then later we were involved in Afghanistan for literally like decades, right? Like the, the I mean. I, I think they don't have the, the, right as of right now, Russia doesn't appear to have the military cap- capability to actually do it decades. Now, that could be propaganda. I'm not discounting uh, It's that. definitely propaganda. I don't they think it's propaganda. I think they've lost the too much. They've lost too much, and their equipment has been proven to be too too. Uh, okay, so too then let's, let's, let's assume that that's true for a second. I, to clarify, definitely don't believe it's true. Sure. But let's presume, let's, let's take a second and, and, and take that as, as fact. That would suggest that there's about to be a massive, awful, bloody civil war across all of Russia? I don't, like I said... I think they can fight to a stalemate as long as we support them. And that stalemate will force both sides to the table. It's stalemate in the way that you're describing requires that Putin die. No, I think Putin can. I think the golden bridge on this is not taking over all the Donetsk region. I think it is. It is maintaining Crimea. And I think Crimea will be. It won't be one of those situations. I, I. I don't know if he can or can't. Zelensky, I, I, if Zelensky agrees to that, Zelensky's going to die. Possibly. 
I, I, not yeah, possibly. This... Zelensky will die. If that is the thing that they get to, Zelensky will die. Of course he will. Okay. Well, well I mean, like, it, a, one, of the, one of the two is going to, no, one of the two is going to happen. Like, that's, that's right, ultimately what's going to happen. But my point is, like, yes, I agree with you. One of those two <laughs> things is going to happen. The answer is that Zelensky should die. No, I, I think that I think it should be Putin. Okay. Unpack for me what the civil war that results in the death of Putin uh, from the, the death of Putin the, looks like. I, I'm not even sure there will be a civil war, but there will be there will be conflict. Um, I don't think it will be. Conflict. It'll be I don't, brutal. I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. And and uh, and because and because Putin was the aggressor, that's why I maintain this position. Okay, but like, you know who wasn't it's, the aggressor? The millions of, of, of Russian people who are going to die as a result of what you're describing. I think that that could possibly be prevented if there's, if there's a coup and then the world, now the world's not, it's not, it's a possibility it's not going to happen, so it doesn't fucking happen. It's not a possibility, like. The world's if, not going to do anything. Coup, the the world is. In a, the, in a country of 144 million people, the, right? The world isn't going to do what is necessary in order to prevent a, a, a super bloody conflict within Russia should Putin die and everybody decides to fight over it. Okay. I'm sorry, I said 144. It's 147 million. Okay. Um, 144 he, he, was, I was excluding Crimea, but we're definitely including Crimea in this now. <laughs> um, so 147 million people. Um, I, again, yeah. I, I, I ultimately, what I think is what is... Zelensky might die in this situation. You are hundred percent think he will. I don't know. We can, there's a lot of, it's, it's a higher possibility of him dying than him not dying. I will, I will say that. I just think that if we, if we maintain. That is the most our, elegant way of saying he's going to die. I've ever heard. <laughs> there's a possibility <laughs> that is higher than that. He will not die. That he will die. Yeah. Okay. I, I hedge all the time, man. I, I've done too much. <laughs> Do you know what good, good judgment project is? No, I don't. So there's a uh, there's a open judgment project. Basically, it's super forecasters. You can say what percentage of a um, of an outcome is likely, and oh, the job. the the better you do at guessing, the the lower the the better your score is, but the lower the lower the number is. And so you can hedge. Yeah. And so if you hedge, you don't lose as many points. I always hedge. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. But but the the thing is is like I I just. There is there is a possible way for for everyone to come out with with something that might be agreeable to them. It's not likely, but it's there. And I think we should push it for it to be there. So maybe Russia doesn't keep all of Crimea in this situation. Maybe they keep a quarter of it so they can still have their port to the Black Sea. But that can only be possible right. if they but fight to a stalemate. If Putin dies. I don't think I think I think Putin could uh, Putin's got such good fucking propaganda and he's got so many people on his back like he's his, the possibility of him dying right now is actually very high because he's losing. <laughs> like, I think because he's losing, True. that's going that's a that's a higher possibility. If we give him a win, it's less likely because then he can claim okay. he's got to so win. I want to I want to compare my previous idea of this one and a half years before Ukraine loses and, and Zelensky gets killed and five years before all of Ukraine is folded into Russia, um, which is, you know, not a great country to live in, but certainly better than North Korea. And certainly, by the way, better than living in Ukraine currently, right? It's better to live in Russia in Hell, peacetime than peace it is to live in Ukraine you. at this moment right now in history. Sure. Um, so in five years, uh, we're back to basically total peace for the people of Ukraine. Um, albeit under a different government um, mm -hmm. and a worse government. Yep. Um, that's one option. The other option is that Putin loses. There's a massive civil war in a country of 140.7 uh, million people, not including the people of Crimea, and also, oh, by the way, literally atomic weapons. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a civil war, and that civil war will definitionally require that China be involved and mm -hmm. definitionally require that the United States be involved and that all of NATO be involved and will probably involve India and will probably involve Iran and will probably involve Saudi Arabia and will certainly involve Israel. Like, this is World War III. We are discussing World War III. Do you think if Putin, Putin gets loses, killed? Kill, okay. Yeah. 
if Putin gets killed and the result is a civil war in Russia, yes, we are, we're definitely talking about millions of people dead. We are definitely talking about um, uh, millions of people being starved to death. We are definitely talking about uh, I, 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 hundred, not hundreds necessarily, but definitely tens of millions of people, uh, refugees. We're talking about the desecration of multiple cities, the bombings into smithereens. We're talking about, yeah, this is going to be terrible. Why is that the only possibility? Okay, I, I get what you're saying. And if that is the only possibility, then it might be better for the world for Zelensky to die. I don't think that's the only possibility. And I don't even think it's the only possibility, like overwhelmingly so. Um, okay, what percent chance do you think that that what I just described happens is? Uh, Given that you like hedging your bets, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll have to think about it more. My my current right now because this is the first. You're not the first person to bring this up, but you're the first person to make a good argument about it. Um, that I've talked to this long. Um, mm-hmm. it's. Better than 50, but under 75. Okay, let's put it at 60. Sure, we'll, we'll split the Okay, down. 60% chance that that happens. Yeah. Okay. Um, Am let's I willing to do, take that risk? <laughs> let's, yeah, know. well, like, let's do, so, I mean, like, we have this idea called insurance, right? Um, so, like, the whole idea of insurance is that you're going to try to do this smaller uh, cost in order to protect against this potentially much larger cost. Sure. I would describe Zelensky dying as like not a very big cost a bad thing for sure but like a relatively small cost comparative to this 60 percent chance of something massively worse happening i don't want to risk a 60 percent chance no i got of you. a civil war in a nuclear state yeah that no, has it, a border it, the size of freaking everything with this, China, this is you know, and it's also a, by the way bordering North Korea, and is also yeah. by the way border like no, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, want no, this. no, no, this I, is I, bad. This is this is this is bad. This is an actual possibility. Unlike I, be, I don't believe Putin will use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. I think that's that's he a done deal. No, he He's won't. not, but his replacement, won't. right? I don't. Mm, that's his replacement. That's who true. Is He's the civil war. His, might, replacement, his replacement might. His replacement might. It depends. Okay. Like I said, it depends. Um, that's more of a possibility. I ultimately, this is the way I view Russia, right? Right now we have a very strong, charismatic person that did everything humanly possible to get and maintain power and subordinate everyone underneath him. That include murders, that include gift giving, that include everything. The whole shebang. Like he took the 44 rules of power and used it to a T. Good for him. Fucking genius, right? Evil person. Genius, right? I'm not going to just this. Uh, I, you can't discount people that are smart, right? Like they can be evil. They can still be geniuses. OK. I don't think anybody that's coming up in the ranks necessarily wants to do all those things. Not not every we'll say everybody. I don't think everybody that's coming through wants to do those things. I think it would be less than everybody because the amount of work and the amount of things you need to be good at to do these things are immeasurable. And I don't think anybody else will be able to. So the way I view Russia as this klepto state where all the oligarchs just want to maintain their own sphere of influence and be left to fuck alone so they can party off in the rest of the world. That is what I think will happen. And I think not happen. I think that is where most of them are at and most of them would maintain it. I don't think there's any, but there's at least to my knowledge, I'm not in the CIA, so I have fucking no actual idea, but it doesn't appear from the information that we have presently. If there's anybody that can actually take that position that Putin has. And so I don't actually worry about that as much as you do, even though it's a 60%, like I said, it's a 60% chance of this happening, because I think that most of the people that are in line to be his successor just want to party it up in the rest of the world and be little oligarchs and have their own little fiefdoms. What is, what, I what is more likely to happen to me is probably the breakup of Russia, not necessarily a civil war. So I don't think that any of the people who would replace Putin are more dangerous once they've replaced Putin. Then it's Putin the fight has. for it, right? Yeah. It's the fight itself yeah. for that replacement sure. position. But I don't that terrifies me. And and I and it is a very justified fear. It's a very justified fear. I think that it is 
the the chance of that happening given where all those oligarchs are and how they've acted i think is actually less than maybe my 60 percent. it's still a 50 percent chance because there's a lot of budding dictators everywhere right um so we could there's probably hundreds of them we don't know about all anywhere in the point in time anywhere in the world um and russia is going to have a lot of them but i don't think it's going to be a fight for all of russia i think you'll see it's more probably a better uh you know, probably as as high. The Civil War is as high of a percentage chance of happening as what I'm saying, which is a disintegration of Russia as a co- cohesive uh, state under this precept. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's like there's a 50 50 chance of it being a dis- disintegrated state and a in a civil bloody civil war to take the whole thing over. <clears throat> I think that's that's where we're at. And if it's between one or the, if it's you don't just dis- don't have those two things in line, it's a 60 percent chance of one of them happening. The numbers didn't add up, but I but you get what I'm saying. Like I think it's a yeah, 50 percent chance from this I just happening. Think that, like the chances of what I'm describing, even if the chances are ten percent, right? It is. It would have to be less than ten times worse yeah. than what we're describing in Ukraine, and it is obviously more than ten times worse than what we're describing right. in Ukraine. No, and I um, and I can agree with. I that. think it's, I, it's it's a lot worse than ten times worse, and I also think it's a lot more likely than ten percent more like uh, percent likely. Sure. And, and and I can agree with that. That is a very reasonable position to hold, and I'm not going to try to convince you out of that position necessarily. But I want to make my position known and yeah. you know, for us to understand yeah. each other. Um, sure. I I just think like, and and again, I'm going to go back to what I think is the likely course of action of what people are actually going to do. I think it's going to be through the winter. If Ukraine makes gains in that then we can that will try to be parlayed into uh, the golden off ramp uh whatever it's called the golden road in in the the art of war i think mm-hmm. that's where where you and i think that's what's going to end up happening um in that situation you are likely to be somewhat cor- uh, likely to be correct more like not somewhat you're likely to be correct that zelensky gets murdered by somebody that's more authoritarian or more ethnically nationalistic um, in that situation, I think that's preventable as well, though. And I think that's preventable with a high chance. So I don't know. Well, that's why I don't want to do it now. Let's let's wait, you know, five, six months. <laughs> let's get through the winter. Yeah, because if we get yeah, through I, the winter, yeah, yeah. I don't think Russia has the capability of fighting more. Like it has the capability of fighting more, but it doesn't. I don't think I, Russia is going. Russia has already said that they're going to use the winter to regroup and reorientate. In order to go back into Ukraine, they're already. They basically they said that um, earlier sure. uh, earlier this week, I believe. Um, That's just the reality of, of how wars ought to be fought in that environment. That would have yes. been true regardless of the scale of and- their military. And that's um, I, I agree with that. I believe that that's the that was always going to happen, which is why I never believed. And he's like, "Winter's coming, and they're going to decimate everybody." No, dude, everybody doesn't want to fight in winter. No one can do it effectively. No Russia's- one can do it. Effectively. No one can do it. Russia's never done it effectively. They've used, they've been able to survive out the winter better than other people. That's what's yep. been happening. They they other people died, and then Russia came in and were like, well, we're good. We're in these fucking they only giant sort parkas. of died. Of all, <laughs> yeah. All, all, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and um, with that not being the case, because it's fighting Ukraine, Ukraine's in the same situation. It's not going to be. They're not going to have that attrition that's going to happen, especially if we continue to fund them. And I think that's going to be the stalemate that we see. And that stalemate can go for years. It can be a come like somebody said, well, we can see a DMZ. I'm like, possibly, but that's no one winning, right? That's no one winning and no one losing. That's not a terrible thing necessarily, is it? Hmm. That's probably a, even a better op- that, that, if that If that stalemate happens and we just continue to somewhat fund Ukraine, or Ukraine is able to like parlay its somewhat ability. Fun, but like we're not spending literally two hundred. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> a lot. I, You're saying I, it, oh whatever, but like it, again, because I don't care about <laughs> it so much. But, 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 like, there's there's two how much did we a, give to the South Koreans during during uh, during their much. thing? And also, it wasn't permanent. And also, the experience that we were like the, the, there's 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 multiple layers that are coming. First, sure. there's the first do no harm thing, which we were not harming South Korea. We were absolutely harming Ukraine. Um, that's number one. Well, the number two, we're harming yeah, Ukraine. We're harming Ukraine. The, when you uh-huh. describe when you describe a a, a permanent war um, as part of American policy, oh, I Ukraine, see, I see. Well, that is that's, absolutely harmful 
Okay, 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 okay. So that, that's 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 fair. That, like, Afghanistan was harmed by our permanent war in Afghanistan. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so because I've 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 announced it, it becomes permanent. Okay, yeah, I gotcha. It wasn't permanent harm because we didn't know that that perpetual war would would happen and the, the DMZ well, would. Well, we by year, let's say twelve in Afghanistan, we definitely knew. Uh, that I was we talking were- about <laughs> South Korea. We sure. Afghanistan was going to be a shit show, like sure, great um, of empires. <laughs> yeah, uh, but so so yeah, so there's so that's one component of it that, that, that we're definitely harming Ukrainians, um, and that Ukrainian like life is in shambles as a result of our actions. Um, there's also the fact that by virtue of this, we're not able to trade with Russia. So long as we're continuing to have sure. this this proxy war, we can't have open trade with Russia. Which is dangerous and bad for our economy and bad for Europe and bad for uh, not as not that I care about Europe as much, but like it's it really is bad for Americans. Um, and I don't like screwing over Americans as a general rule of thumb when I'm talking about the American government. Um, and so, like, yeah, the cost of this are, are 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 major, major, major. It's not just the financial, although again, I do believe that the financial does matter, which perhaps we disagree with. Um, I think we have uh, the capacity to do to do both. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's just that I I don't everything that we're doing right now isn't going to suddenly free up more money for else other people. It's it's not that I don't think that's how our our monetary system fundamentally works, or as well as the United States financial situation is. I think that's our fundamental disagreement on that. Yeah, it's not that it doesn't I, I, matter. I, I, it's, I think we just have a different relationship to debt. Is what it ultimately comes down to. Yeah. I don't believe that the amount of debt that we're in um, can yeah, I, be resolved in any way other than defaulting. I, I literally um, don't care about the debt. As long as we service it, nobody's going to care. As long as we keep making payments. Yeah, but my point matter. is eventually we're going to default. And when Why we would default, we default? We're going to default eventually because eventually, there, for whatever reason it might, might come, uh, uh, China and the other co- uh, countries and other people um, who are reliant on us uh, to, uh, to pay them back will uh see the dollar slipping and they're going to request it back and they're going to stop uh buying the, the, more debt. the vast ma- but we don't need them to buy our debt that's okay we don't need to have an mmt debate yeah, no, <laughs> so, no. um <laughs> yeah we can have that at a different point I, i'd be interested in the conversation but but that's a different conversation um yeah, but yeah i i think the, the 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 cost to us even beyond the financial is just a massive massive cost and i don't I, i'm not comfortable um spending that kind of money um, okay. Or spending that, that amount of, of, of um, resources lives and yeah. resources. Um, no, that's fair. Yeah. Um, so yeah, go for it. So uh, it's it's all. I don't know how what time it is for you. It's almost eleven for me. Um, it's, it's midnight for me. Okay. So uh, cool. how much longer do you want to continue doing this? <laughs> um. How about? Okay, let's let's do this. Let's do like closing statements by virtue of um you describe what you want to see the American government do and I describe what I, th- I want the American government to do. Okay, a uh, little bit of a context. Is this in relation to Ukraine specifically or just in general? Yeah. In, well, actually, yeah, let's do in general and then also in Ukraine. Okay. So, uh I'll do in general and then you can do in general and then I'll do then you can do Ukraine and I'll do Ukraine. Sound fair? That's totally fair. So, uh, so in general, the United States should take into account what international things are happening that will negatively impact the United States and its citizens. I believe that these things include military conflicts that doesn't necessarily directly involve mil- uh, Americans because of our trade relations and other things, as I said earlier in the show. So with that taken into account, I think the United States does spend way too much money on its military. Um, I not even spend. I think the United States uh, favors its military m- more so than other things the United States should favor. That includes diplomacy and that includes uh, domestic um, domestic investments such as healthcare, housing, uh, education, etc. The things that actually make a good quality of life and increase the protective capacity of the United States citizens, as well as in trust, engendering trust in the United States. Ultimately, the primary purpose of the gov- of any government is to protect its its people from externalities of the world, 
That can include being invaded or that include, you know, trade relations breaking down, etc. As well as engendering a sense of civic trust inside its own polity. So for us, that's the United States. We all live in the United States. We're a single country. There should the government should make as help us trust each other and the government as much as possible. That is ultimately the purpose of the government, and that's ultimately the purpose of how the United States should operate. I believe it does that through not favoring its military as much as it is, and instead use utilize uh, start favoring um, in, internally again healthcare, housing, education, um, food, etc., security, blah blah blah, and uh, for international relations, more diplomacy, military less used. That's okay. Out of it. Um, yeah. So, so my basic belief so, uh, is that the job of any government internationally is to protect its trade interests and protect its ability to travel, um, protect its citizens' ability to travel, mm -hmm. um, and protect its its citizens' ability to be safe in doing so. Um, so, when I think about, uh, you know, when I compare the safety um, of going through the world um, as someone from New Zealand, they are safer in Russia than an American is. Um, because they are not going to be held for ransom in the same way that, that, that America, Americans are. Um, uh, when I think about who is safer um, in uh, Afghanistan, when I think about who's safer in North Korea, when I think about who's safer um, in, in you know, a whole host of different places, um, uh, we are making our people less safe when they travel there, and we're making it more difficult to trade as an American company. We're making it more difficult to trade as an American individual um, on the international stage. Um, than we could if we were less financially and uh, excuse me less less militaristically uh, mm -hmm. involved and more financially intertwined with these countries. Um, I think that the job of the United States is to protect Americans, and that's it. And every single choice that we make as a government should be exclusively on the basis of will this or will this not help the American people. Um, and if it's not part of that conversation, it shouldn't be part of the, 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 the duties of the United States government. Um, so then I'm, I'm also talking about my, my Ukraine stance yeah, now as well. Yeah, you do Ukraine first, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, cool. Um, in terms of Ukraine, uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that we, we should be, um, I don't want to say that we shouldn't be involved because that's not what I believe. I think that we should be involved. But I think that we should be involved um, at a level of, um, certainly we should be, be internationally condemning it. Um, and we should also be, uh, providing, um, uh, uh, fiscal situation, providing the, the fiscal network, um, wherein people are able to, uh, to maintain like a quality life. We should be trying to, uh, uh, generate ways of, for example, we should be trying to do like, um, I, I, ways of making it easier to be a refugee. We should be making it easier for mm. people um, to get out of there. We should be trying to make ways for people um, to, uh, you know, maintain uh, education for their children. We should be trying to to do certain things that ingratiate us with that with that population, um, and also will ultimately serve um, the the global economy and an economy that will inter uh, intertwine them with us. Um, those things, I think, make a whole host of a lot of sense for the United States. But the military involvement, um, I think, ultimately uh, is, number one, uh, and this is the thing that I think matters most from my own perspective. I would be lying if I pretended this wasn't what I care about most. Um, I don't think it serves the American people's interest. But number two, I don't even think that it, it serves um, the Ukrainian people's interest um, to be doing what we're doing um, at the scale that we're doing it. And for the length of time that I think we're almost certainly going to be expecting uh, to be doing it for. Um, but yeah, that's basically my, my thought. Yeah. So for, for Ukraine specifically, it should be done. What we, what we should be doing is trying to stop an active invasion. And the reason I believe that is because I believe an active invasion of a nascent dem democratic system of a, of a potential ally um, is shows that the world is weak and that uh, that the people that are willing to enact violence upon others is um, is is going to be done without any sort of pushback and that will actually increase uh, global instability as other countries do this more often 
it is not i would say it's not domino theory because it's not ideologically driven it's just that we have people that are willing to use force against others and when they do so without pushback without uh you know condemnation without uh, actual pushback where they actually lose something doesn't really do anything it doesn't stop them from doing it and so if they're emboldened to do it which is what i think russia has been emboldened to do with its uh it's it being involved in georgia moldova whatever the other country is i can't remember the name of it um that's partly why we got to where we got to i believe that that is in the united states americans best interest americans interest because of the way the global system is currently structured and that the amount of chaos that will ultimately result from that destructuring happening on a um a less controlled manner will negatively impact trading negatively impact the ability for people to travel etc because all those things will be uh will, will there be more conflict in the world not less from that with that said i don't necessarily think it's a uh, a all or nothing situation i think there are ways to offer the golden road to to putin and ultimately i want to see what happens going into the spring and that's where i'm at with with ukraine i think what we're doing right now is warranted but that should always be re-examined um as new situ as new things develop so uh, never never stick to a policy just because it's working now doesn't mean that it's going to be working in the future so there, everything has to be taken into account there and that's where that's where i'm at so cool do All as right. much as you can and when it ceases to be in the interest of the united states to do so stop all right awesome um any last words or should we call it a night i i think we can call it uh this was a great conversation i always love talking to you man you're like one of the best people i've talked to on the, yeah, the I, scene. I enjoy talking to you as well yeah so yeah but um all right sweet uh, before before you go though um what was yeah do you you, you wanted do you want to make this a little a more often thing uh sure yeah we can do that okay uh, just DM me what kind of topic you want to talk about, and we'll see how we can fit it in. All right, sweet. Keep good. Thanks, man. All right, have a good night. You too.